pleasure to be here with you tonight as part of the 2022 three-day Women Making Waves conference. This week, some 600 alumni from across the globe have been connecting through virtual panel discussions, the online community, and small group discussions. We have Tulaneans from across the country, San Diego to New York, and Phoenix to Fort Lauderdale, and even internationally too, Nigeria, Shanghai, Sarajevo, Panama, and Colombia. Everyone's been engaging with each other in meaningful ways. This year's theme, visionary leadership, cultivating culture in a new normal, when nothing these days feels normal, not even the weather. It is a timely topic that all of us can relate to, both in the workplace and in our communities. I look forward to tonight's continued conversation focused on how economic changes affect leadership strategies. Please join me in welcoming Alicia Butler-Pierre, Shelley Cayette, and Lori Ann Goldman. Alicia will be our panel facilitator. She graduated from the AB Freeman School of Business in 2004 and is the founder and CEO of Equilibria Inc., a boutique operations management firm specializing in increasing bandwidth for fast-growing small businesses. She is a podcaster, an author, a speaker, and process engineer. Alicia, thank you for facilitating tonight's conversation. Next, we have Shelley Kayat, who graduated from the AB Freeman School of Business in 2006 and is an executive vice president, chief commercial officer with the Cleveland Cavaliers. Shelley is an experienced marketing strategy and sales professional with a demonstrated history of working in the sports industry and growing various corporate brands. Shelley, thanks to you for joining us and sharing your unique perspectives from the business world and professional sports. Joining Shelley is Lori Ann Goldman, a 1984 Newcomb College graduate, just like me. Shelley is the CEO of LA Ventures, an investment and advisory firm she founded for growth-oriented, consumer-facing businesses. Lorianne is the former CEO of both Spanx and Avon with over 30 years experience building global consumer product businesses and brands. Lorianne, welcome. We are eagerly awaiting your insights as a business person and an investor. So how amazing are all these Tulanians? I can't wait to hear their inspiring stories. Alicia, at this point, I think we're ready to turn the conversation over to you and to the panel. Wonderful introductions, Libby. It's a pleasure to join you all today. And before we get into our panel discussion, we actually want to know a little bit more about you, those who are attending this session right now. You should see a poll. It's going to ask what is your leadership role? And the reason we're asking this question is because that's actually going to help me determine how I best frame the questions that I'll ask Shelly and Lorianne, as well as how they craft their responses. So take a few seconds right now and tell us which best describes your current role as it pertains to leadership. Are you in currently in a leadership role? Are you an aspiring or maybe an emerging leader? Or are you an entrepreneur? Do you own your own company? So go ahead and take a few seconds, answer that poll, and we're, once we understand the results, then we can get right into our panel discussion. Okay, do we have any responses? Or we wanna give it a few more seconds. Should I, is there a specific place I should click to look at the survey responses or the poll responses? There are 33% in a leadership role, 44 in aspiring leaders, and 22% own their own company. Okay, thank you. So that tells us over half of our attendees so far are in some type of a leadership position already. Thank you for that. So something that I noticed, Lorianne and Shelley, as I was doing research on both of your backgrounds, I noticed that both of your careers actually started in sales and marketing, which I thought was really fascinating. And Lorianne, I'm actually wondering if we can start with you. 
noticing that your career spans over 30 years, and you have a very rare quality in that you've started businesses, you've actually grown and scaled up a startup, and you've led a publicly traded company. Where exactly did your career start? Oh, you're muted, Lorianne. My career started in New Orleans um, at Maison Blanche, which is now the Ritz-Carlton, um, where I was in charge of special events and Mr. Bingle. So anybody from New Orleans may know who Mr. Bingle is, but he's uh, the snowman that never melts in the South, and um, even when it's warm. <laughs> <laughs> And that was my first job and uh, learned a lot, stayed in retail until I, um, until I moved to Atlanta to take a position with Coca-Cola. And then you worked at Coca-Cola for about 10 years? Yes. Uh, complete decade, 1990 to 2000. Yes. And is that when you, is that where you first started to rise into leadership positions? Was it at Coca-Cola? I would say so. You know, I had a, you know, everything I think in my entire career, Alicia, has been serendipity. And I was thinking about the audience answering that question about whether you're a leader or aspiring leader. And even after being a CEO for all these years and sitting on public company boards and so forth, I still think I'm an aspiring leader. <laughs> and, um, so I think, you know, you're, you're learning you know, something every day. Um, but I, I had a chance meeting with the CEO because um, of a promotion I did in um, stadiums, um, which Shelley would be familiar with. Um, and he happened to ask me if I knew anything about retail because he thought he had remembered that. And he asked me to look at the licensing program, which was a cost center. It was called the Trademark Protection Program. And it was costing the Coca-Cola, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars because there were trademark pirates taking on mm. the Coca-Cola trademark and then we would be ransomed and have to pay it back. So um, I started as an entrepreneur there, you know, really telling him like, I could just think of all the Coca-Cola stuff I could sell and that would be the best trademark protection you would get to actually, you know, be a, you know, a, a merchant and, you know, have consumers buying your product. That's the best way to protect your trademark worldwide. So that was really the first business that I started. I was an wow. entrepreneur, I think they call it now. <laughs> yes, entrepreneur for sure. And so, so you eventually left Coke, as I understand it, and you start yeah. working for this what was a very small company back then known as Spanx. Is that correct? <laughs> I uh, was pregnant with my third son um, and all my, my children are, are now in um, their 20s. And um, I was taking a long maternity leave um, after I'd really asked for a package because Coke was going through a lot of changes. And I was in a strategy role and I just said, you know, if I had to cut jobs, I would cut mine. And, you know, maybe this would be a good time for me to go focus on my, on my family. Um, and through another chance meeting in the hosiery department at Saks, met the founder's ex-boyfriend. And to make a fairly short story even shorter, I became CEO of Spanx. <laughs> wow. Shopping for fishnets because I still had baby fat. <laughs> Now, I was not expecting that as your Spanx story, not at all. But you were there for a, a fairly long time as well, right? About 12 years? Yeah, I, I uh, am very loyal. And, you know, I always tell women that that is a common mistake women make, you know, being too loyal mm. uh, to, you know, to their careers. And I don't know if I fell into the too loyal category um, because that's a wonderful quality. But um you know, you stay long enough where you can unpack your bags and, and accomplish something. And I certainly was able to do that in both positions. But, you know, after leaving Spanx, it was like speed dating for business. And, you know, I, I just learned so much about so many different companies working with private equity and, you know, advising and consulting and being on board. So it was, um, it was a great change and, uh, and fun. And that change eventually led to you becoming, being a board member of Avon, right? And then eventually right. becoming CEO. 
and and now sitting on various board (laughs) positions, owning your own business. Once again, you have your own business. I'm really passionate about women's businesses, and I do sit on um, on a lot of boards. And I just joined um, two um, wonderful companies. I'm chairing Claire's, which everybody maybe remembers from getting their ears pierced um, at at Claire's. Um, and it's my first chairman role, so that'll be I'll be an aspiring leader in um, in that role. But you know, really shaping you know, young women. And um, I also joined the, the, the board um, of Adore Me, which is another intimate apparel company that's focused on the direct consumer business. So it balances out, you know, a technology company and, um, you know, television film board called 101 Studios and Joe and the Juice, which is food service. And so, um, but I love my women's companies even, you know, have a special place in my heart, not any favorites, but. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for kind of walking us through your career and in a relatively short period of time. Uh, Shelly, I, I, you, you actually answered one of the first questions that I had for you. And that, that question was, are you from Louisiana? And so you, you've already told us that yes, you are in fact from Louisiana. Was your first job outside of college, was it at Harris Casino in New Orleans or did you did your professional career start at another company? No, that is, is correct. First of all, Alicia, thanks for having me and, and great to be here with uh, Lurianne. I love the inspiration and energy that both of you bring and making ways in your own successful career. So so great to be here joining you today. Um, I uh, started my career was at Harris. So I was in, I played basketball um, throughout most of my my young, um, you know, from from high school and even in college, again at Tulane, um, and I was actually looking to give sports a break for a little bit, um, which is how I ended up in the casino industry. It really was, you know, one of the few um, companies that was in New Orleans um, advertising. I started in advertising and marketing and database marketing, um, which was really helpful. Learning um, the casino industry has a great deal of. Um, detail around data and, and, and how they, they approach data for their business. It was great to learn in that space. Um, and then I, um, I went to a career fair. Um, Caesars was uh, restructuring corporately. Um, so they were moving um, their headquarters of what we were doing to Tunica, Mississippi. Um, and I have nothing against Tunica, Mississippi, but I am from a very small town, St. James, Louisiana, and it wasn't the right timing in my career just out of college to go back to a small town. Um, <laughs> boss um, at the time, Sandy McNamara actually said, hey, we have a great relationship with the Hornets. Um, you should go. I know they're moving back from Oklahoma after Hurricane Katrina, and you should consider an opportunity there. And I had never thought about working in sports. I think the irony is you know, I'm, I'm 6'3", and I've been in sports. So people just think that there's this natural connection of why I'm in here and here 16 years later. Uh, and it wasn't. It was um, just based on that situation that I jumped back into sports, um, interviewed with the Hornets, started in marketing, um, did that for a year, and then moved into space, which I had no idea it existed, right? There's not really a manual um, and, and what that looks like. And so learned a bit of the business on that side. And then, again, the rest is history from there. Um, I moved to uh, Cleveland in 2012. I was recruited to come out um, here and, and, and lead sponsorship for, for the Cavalier opportunity of what they were looking to do and, and transform their business on the sponsorship side. And, um, and then here, uh, almost nine years later, uh, leading now all of the sales and, and revenue areas of the business. And Shelly, again, as I was doing my research on you prior to today's to this panel discussion, I, w- I noticed, you know, you've been a VP, a senior VP, and now an executive VP, and, and to be more specific, a chief commercial officer. Can you talk to us a little bit about the differences between what it means to be a VP versus senior VP and, and on to you, your current position as an executive vice president? Yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> um, you know, because th- there's no model for it, right? And I think Lorraine spoke about that earlier. Sometimes you're in, you're doing leadership roles and getting into leadership, and you don't really know it, right? It's people that the serendipity. I really like that phrase because um, you just come in. I came in t- to do a job moving the business forward, and I started doing it successfully and got promoted, right? So that's to VP, right? Um, and then 
Um, you know, people move around. My boss ended up taking another opportunity somewhere else. And so I got promoted again um, until senior vice president, which at first I was overseeing most of our, our current partners. Um, and then I oversaw the entire corporate partnership team of about 30 individuals, right? So that's new business sales, that's current partnership business, that's driving digital um, and media revenue for the business. So the whole uh, umbrella of corporate partnerships. Um, and then, um, so I was, that was senior vice president. And then um, again, someone else got another opportunity um, at a different organization. And so in our ticket sales side of the business, which is completely separate, there's two main revenue areas, which is corporate partnerships and ticket sales, in addition to broadcast, right, revenue for teams. And so I now oversee all of ticket sales, all of premium suites, our youth uh, programming. So it's about 100 employees altogether between those two organizations. And also we have multiple properties. So we have a hockey league, American Hockey League team. We have a G League um, developmental league a team um, for the NBA um, and then we have an esports team. So all of those areas kind of unfold under the, the term of commercial, chief commercial officer. Well, thank you. I, because I was curious, I was thinking to myself, what on earth is a chief commercial officer? So thank you for <laughs> explaining that to us or, or for us, Shelly. I appreciate that. Now, as I'm listening to, to you, Shelly, and, and also to your responses, Laurieann, one thing that's clear to me is that you all have, I, I think I would think it's fair to say that you embrace change and that you you kind of just allow your careers to progress somewhat organically, if, if that's a, a good way of, of describing it. And one thing that we all know about leadership is that it's, it's not static, it's dynamic. And that's very evident listening to both of your stories. And with that being said, with constant being the only change, there's been an unprecedented amount of change. I think we can all agree over the past two years. And I, this was a quote and I'm, I'm probably paraphrasing it here, but something that Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft said, this was right at the onset of the pandemic in 2020. We've experienced roughly two years of digital transformation in just two months. And every time I think about that quote, it kind of gives me chills and goosebumps because with that type of rapid change and transformation also comes mental health related challenges, the anxiety, the depression, uh, and, and all sorts of other types of unhealthy behavior. I'm wondering if each of you could speak a little bit to some things that, some tips, strategies, and techniques that you've employed to maintain your mental health as you lead <laughs> through this type of, of Again, unprecedented change. There's always going to be change, but there's been such a, a huge amount of change in such a short period of time. So, Shelly, if we can start with you and then Lorianne, if you could then give a response to that as well. And, and not only mental health, keep maintaining your own mental health, but for those of your team members as well. That is a very loaded question. <laughs> 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 The last two years, you know, it, it changed, and I, I'm when I actually embrace change, I think that's why I've been successful in my career because I love to see. I think with change comes opportunity, uh, right? And it's a matter of as leaders, how do you how do you take a team who's because everybody's not comfortable with change, right? How do you take them through that, keep them on track, give them the right um, roadmap of how we're going to get there so they can see the end goal, right? Because that's the end of the day. They don't want to be in that mist of chaos for a long period of time. So um, I add it to the to the, the COVID situation because I'm also seven months pregnant. So there was a lot to so talk about personal mental. Um, oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, we just wanted to be able to put it all in at one time, right? <laughs> so what I would say, I think personally, again, my goal was to ensure you know you got a team of people that are looking up to you and they are questioning everything. They don't know what's next. And at the end of the day, we don't know what's next, right? I remember sitting in in boardrooms with our CEO trying to figure out what's next and it was literally day by day and they would drastically change, you know, are we in the office, are we out of the office, you know, and, and pulling people into and pulling their lifestyles, right? They've got daycare that they're trying to figure out. They've got other family that they're trying to figure out. They're dealing with illness. And, and, and so I think it's a matter of empathy, um, providing a very clear path for, look, we don't know exactly where this is going to end, but I'm going to, I'm going to work through this with you. I'm going to uh, be flexible to you 
Um, but also leading by example, because it's one thing for me to try to tell my team to do that, but then they look at me and I'm nonstop, right? Um, so I think for me, personal help was we have to figure out a balance, right? And, and I, there's no perfect balance. And, you know, this whole work-life balance, I don't think it exists, right? I think you figure out what's going on in your environment at that time, um, and then you react to that. And so for us, it was just being a bit more patient with our team members, listening to our team members more. Um, and then working around that in the sports industry, there's no such thing as working from home, right? It's not like everything was, you know, our, our business is here in the venue, right? We want people to come in here, um, but we had to balance the rest of the world that was doing something completely different. Um, and so I think that is just listening, um, being empathetic, um, a lot more patient. And the biggest part I would say is just leading by example making sure that I was taking the time that I needed for my family. I also have a two-year-old at home. Um, and so, I, you know, just making sure that I was showing them that I'm taking care of my family first, myself, right, first. And then I want to make sure that I'm, you know, putting obviously work where it needs to be and getting the job done for what needs to be done. Awesome. Lorianne, how about you? What are you doing to, to protect um, and maintain your mental health? <laughs> <laughs> I, I might take, since Alicia took kind of more of the, the business side, I may talk a little more personally about kind of what it was like. And, you know, one of the funny things, you know, when you're a CEO and even on a lot of these boards, you have all these psychological studies that they do on you to determine whether you're going to be successful, you know? So mm -hmm. um, they, I've, I've had several of, of those done. And um, one of the things that always came out really as a strong quality was that I was comfortable with ambiguity. And so mm -hmm. when I started COVID, I kept telling myself, but all these studies have said, you know, you're comfortable with ambiguity and not knowing, you know, what's next. And I was anything but comfortable. Um, I had gotten divorced, um, I guess about a, a year or two before the, the pandemic started. I was um, dating a, a guy who I thought I needed to break up with. And then he said, when I told him I wanted to break up, he said, um, even at my age, I'm 59, he's the same age. He said, well, let's just do a two week victory lap on you know, our relationship. <laughs> and you know, let's break up in two weeks. And he was, okay. summer, and, um, he, was go he was going through his own divorce after five years of being separated. And I was just kind of tired of that. And, and um, so I said, well, okay. <laughs> you know? And then about seven days later, I got COVID and he said, well, if you have COVID, then I'm going to have COVID. So, you know, why don't we just, you know, um, uh, quarantine together. And I said, well, that's only going to be like three weeks. And so he brought his backpack over and we started living together. And it was, um, I don't know that I would have ever done that. I, um, you know, was married for, for 26 years and I'm really independent and um, I'm not sure I would have ever given up that much independence. I mean, maybe eventually, but it would have taken me time. And I think relationships either got stronger or weaker. I used to say, you know, about um, products that, you know, anytime you, you use a product or try a product, you know, your brand gets stronger, your brand gets weaker. And I think that happened with relationships, you know, I think during COVID, you know, you, you tried all this togetherness and your relationships either got stronger or weaker. And so that was, you know, wonderful for me because um, I think I let down my guard and the, you know, ambiguity of not knowing what was, was going on was made a little bit easier, you know, by that. I think professionally, I've always gotten so much energy from people. I mean, it's hard for me sitting by myself and my home tonight, you know, to talk to all of you when, you know, typically I would do this and, you know, you'd all visit afterward and many people would come up and say, well, I want to meet you or shake your hand or here's my card or here's a, a business, you know, thing. And you would just get so much energy from the audience. And so it was really hard for me to try to, you know, to recreate that type of feeling, you know, through, um, through Zoom meetings. And I've gotten better at it, but um, I just, I, I don't think it's the way forward. And I think that people being in the office, um, being together, you know, finding 
and learning from each other. You know, it's it's what humans were meant to do. And I think the technology is is wonderful, um, but I don't think it helps our mental health. I think it it maybe helps our efficiency, but you look back at so many, you know, times when there were really big gains in, in technology. And I think people suffered. I think it's, you know, continuing with social media and, you know, young people and children. And uh, yeah, there's, there's anxiety and depression that comes from that. And I, I know from my businesses that um, it's the number one, you know, issue and um, just actually started an insurance company that's focused on employee um, benefits and our, the name of the company is Overalls and it's on the AI, um, .ai. And the first thing we say on the homepage is like, you know, I won't say a curse word, but, you know, it starts with an S, it ends with a T and it happens. <laughs> so, um, and I think that recognition that, you know, everybody's like, you know, it, it's, it's really, it's really, really hard. And, you know, I've never been good at faking things. And so I think that kind of honesty and transparency and, you know, saying this sucks and, you know, being vulnerable helps others to kind of, you know, maybe relax and talk a little bit. And I think, you know, Whenever I'm having anxiety or depression, I you know, take a bath, go for a run, you know, or call somebody to try to focus on their problems instead of my own. <laughs> and so those are my secrets to, you know, to mental health. And then, of course, I throw in the glass of wine, you know, fairly often um, as well. But the first three are more successful <laughs> at, <laughs> at, at helping, you know, those, you know, really significant, you know, mood changes. I think it's it's really interesting, Laurieann, that you mentioned being tested so many different times to see whether or not you have what it <laughs> takes, I guess, right, to be to be an effective and yeah. successful leader with the ability to handle ambiguity being one of those things. And, and Shelly, you mentioned the importance of being empathetic. I'd like to build on that because we're, we're talking about all of this, this disruptive change, and there's been disruptions, as we know, in supply chains and the way we work. Uh, the Great Resignation, for example, and now most recently, war. So something that I've read about a, a characteristic of great leadership is your ability to, to keep your cool in the midst of the chaos. So <laughs> Lorianne, I'd like to ask you this yeah. first, and then Shelly, please weigh in. How do you keep, I mean, you've, you've already shared some of your, your tips and, and tricks, but <laughs> But, but seriously, how do you how do you kind of keep your cool? And even though you you might really be losing your starts with S and yeah. <laughs> how do you keep keep your cool um, and not let because if 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 the people that you are leading see you kind of become unhinged, then what does that mean for the rest of the company? So yeah. how do you handle chaos chaos and being calm in the midst of chaos? Know. It's, I think we, we certainly all have our own psychological, you know, profiles, you know, I, I always tell, tell everybody when they ask me like, you know, what's like your style, you know, and I'll say I'm, yeah, I'm kind of like a laid back type A and, you know, I'm, I have, um, really interesting parents. My mom's an artist, um, highly, highly intuitive, um, creative. She knew she'd never read the Wall Street Journal, but she told my father several days before it, it reached its, you know, high and then its immediate, you know, low that she thought they should sell all their stock because she felt something was going on, you know, and wow. she just totally believes in like that side of, of kind of letting go and the universe and, and so forth. She's 83. Um, my dad is 87. They both live in New Orleans on St. Charles Avenue, about a mile or so uh, mm -hmm. down from Tulane. And he's a Mensa mathematician, serious. Um, he was the chairman of the board of the Tulane Medical School and Hospital System. And um, three of, you know, my, my great aunts went to Tulane like in 1905. I mean, we have deep roots at wow. Tulane. 
but he's he's so just like doesn't even get a joke sometimes because he's such a problem solver and I think I got like a big dose of both of them and I you know I think kind of the more laissez faire, like things are just going to work out. I got from my mom and, you know, I got the, the drive and the problem solving from my dad. And I, I can feel my brain switching, you know, to the left and right um, as things go. But I think it's just trusting there's going to be a good outcome. Um, but that doesn't mean not doing everything you can, you know, to find solutions, multiple solutions, um, to solve any, you know, problem, um, you know, that you, that you might have. So, um, I don't know, I, I, I do keep my cool and, um, and try to really enjoy myself and have a good time. And I think, uh, you know, that's a very New Orleans thing as well, you know, having grown up in, you know, New Orleans. And I think that that allows everybody else to not take things maybe quite as seriously, <laughs> because even among, uh, you know, amid like the, you know, horrible things that happened, you were talking about supply chain and I, I, I'll share the story quickly, but when I was at Spanx, we were launching swimwear and we had been working on it for about a year and had, you know, I totally know what a chief commercial officer is, Shelly, but, you know, we had sold it in everywhere and um, Bloomingdale's was going to be a big buyer. And, you know, about two weeks before the launch, they called and said, you know, oh, by the way, like we, we just need, I had hand surgery, if you guys are wondering what I have on my hand. Um, could you just send us the chlorine test for, you know, your swimsuits? You know, they look great, but we just need the chlorine test. And we're like, you know, my head of, you know, product development and supply chain came in and said, like, we didn't do it, chlorine test, you know, what are we going to do? Oh, wow. And, you know, we're going to have to cancel it. We're going to have to destroy all the inventory, cancel the launch. And, you know, I always say you have to take a night to think about it. And um, so, you know, I was problem solving at the dinner table with my son and, you know, telling my, my husband at the time about this issue. And my son just cracked me up and he said, like, who like wears Spanx, you know, bathing suits, mom? Like, isn't it moms? Like, what, won't moms be wearing it? And I said, yeah, I would say that's probably the, you know, the largest part of our, our consumer segment. He said, well, moms don't even go in the water. So you don't have to worry about the chlorine. <laughs> but anyway, we, the solution was we soaked the swimsuits in um, the pool in my backyard for three days and nothing happened. And so that's longer than any mom would stay in the water. And that was our chlorine test to Bloomingdale's and we got their quality control people to accept it. So uh, there's always a way out. <laughs> Moral of the story, think on your feet and ask exactly. your children. When in doubt, ask your kids. <laughs> that is so true. <laughs> Shelly, uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, well, first of all, I like the, the laid back type A. I, I think this is, <laughs> really suits me. I think we're still sisters then, Lorianne. Um, <laughs> I think how you respond, while COVID was extreme, it's how you respond to that as a leader is how you would respond to any other dramatic thing that came up, right? Small or large. Um, and for me, um, and I, I kind of go through my, my life like this, but there's two options that you have for reactions, right? So if something traumatic happens, you either get go into a chaotic phase and react, react, react. And the same outcome is going to happen is if you don't do that and you can think about it and keep your cool, right? You have two mm -hmm. options and you choose one of them. You're likely going to land at the same thing. So why stress yourself out over the <laughs> reactionary when you're going to land in the same place, right? And probably quicker if you're calmer because you could think clearer. Um, so for me, that's how I just approach in general when things happen, you know, before it's like an immediate response. And look, sometimes it's a fault. I had to go through that from a leadership standpoint because people think I, I don't connect as much or relate as much. It's not yeah. that, it's that I choose not to react right away, um, try to internalize it first, kind of, you know, assess it before because people are watching. Um, yeah. I think that's- really I really like that, Shelly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of like useless energy to like get all like worked up about nothing. And when you see other people doing it, you really want to reach out and, you know, hug them, pat them on the back and just say, hey, you know, um, it's going to be okay. <laughs> you know, this is, 
this is not going to help you to be like honking and screaming in traffic, you know, when, you know, I, to your point, Shelly, I think you're going to get there in the same amount of time, um, you know, than if you didn't go through all those shenanigans. So um, that's a, it's a great leadership lesson. And I certainly got better at it as the years, you know, go on and you just have to know yourself emotionally. And, you know, I always look at kind of what are my tendencies that are not good and, you know, try to catch myself before I go into those natural tendencies. <laughs> yeah, I am with you that like the constant learning about it. You know, I think even it goes back to not just when chaotic things happen, but I think the leadership style for me playing basketball, um, I would not go to a college that had scream, a screamer and a yeller. There are plenty of great coaches that are screamers and yellers. Um, to me, they get the same. I, I don't respond to that. Well, I, I, I can listen to you. And it's not good to me. I'm also going to get to the same place if you would have just told me your purpose. And stern. There's a difference between being stern. I'm not saying there's like a laid back and you don't, you know, react. Like if, from accountability standpoint and, you know, in leadership, you got to hold people accountable and, and people know when you're serious, right? Like when I'm, you know, it's time to get serious and it's time to get to an outcome. People know that I'm serious, but um, I don't need to scream and yell. And sometimes in the sports environment, you get that a lot too, where you have yeah, these leaders yeah. that have seen other leaders do that. And they feel that's the only way they can get people to respond. And the truth is everybody responds differently. Um, not everybody's going to be the laid back and, and, and take and not overreact. And I get that. We're not, we're all different personalities, but you know, the point is that I think we're all here for a reason and a place. And so if I can use the ability that I have to not overreact, to help calm people and, yeah. and in a better place, I think that would be a good place for me to help. Um, so it's an interesting journey for sure. Yeah. I remember somebody told me with my children, they said, um, it was like a parenting, you know, I'm, I'm very into like self-help and I'll, I love any, you know, books and tips and motivational things, but um, they said the best way to not argue with your children is to not argue. And I said, you know, that really like relates to so many different things. You, know? it's like, you just don't do it. <laughs> it's hard to argue with somebody that's not arguing back. And it's the same way with like people that are reacting or acting badly. If, you know, if you, uh, you know, do the opposite, then they really have no place, you know, to go. So my kids learned that lesson from me. And employees did too, you know, <laughs> so. That's a very helpful tip for my two year old. But just don't argue, you know? they, don't, they, they won't know what to do, you know, they're just trying to get a rise out of you. <laughs> and Laurie, I'm, I'm actually glad you mentioned, you know, uh, resources and because that's, that's the last question. I, I, unfortunately, we, our time together is starting to come to a close and I want to make sure that we are able to pose the questions that some of the attendees are starting to ask. But I would be remiss if I did not ask each of you, being that you, as you've progressed through your careers, obviously at one point when you were first starting out, you were being mentored, I'm sure at some point. Or, and, and now you probably are the mentor. So you went from being the mentee to being the mentor. If there was one book that you could recommend to everyone who's listening and watching this right now that has really helped you in terms of career development and maybe even from a leadership perspective, what is that one book? Shelly, let's start with you. One. Okay, so I'm going to cheat. I got it more than one, but they can. Okay, of... that's good too. <laughs> and I say that because I think there's a balance. Um, look, what, one of my first books, my best friend in college, her mom was a professor in Houston, um, gave me a book um, by John Maxwell, The Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. Um, and then after that, his invaluable uh, laws of growth. Um, so for me, from like just an academic perspective of you know, because in sports anyway, there's not as much of a leadership training, right, as some companies or organizations may have. And so there were some valuable lessons that I learned in there when you're trying to soak it all up very early. And then you get into real life. So really, that was the best book, to be honest, just the real life experiences. Um, but I would balance that. There was a recent one, um, Tia Graham has Be Happy. And I say that because I was so focused on the leadership skill sets, qualities of like the operations and the business starting out, that I didn't think about so much the intrinsic value, right? The people side of things of how to like think about people psychologically and like how to really motivate them. And that, you know, you don't always have to be right. And, you know, and, 
and, and, and, and lead and tell them, you know, like tell them exactly what to do, kind of empower them. So I think those are balances, like one's more academic, one's more about people, um, intrinsic value. So I would, I would say those, those three. <laughs> Thank you. And out of those three, I, I definitely know of the first one that you mentioned. I'll, I'll have to add the other two to my Amazon wish list. Yeah. So thank you for that, Shelley. How about you, Laurieann? You know, the one that I, I um, immediately went to, which um, is really not a business book, it's really a, a mental health book. And I, um, not a really mental health, but it's a self-help book. But I read it when I was in my 20s and it was called The Road Less Traveled. And the, the book starts, it's by E. Scott Peck. Um, it's an old book. I've made all of my children read it numbers of times. I have pages falling out of it, but the first line of the book is life is difficult. And the concept um, is really about, you know, being accountable for yourself and um, not blaming others, you know, for, for things. And it goes, I mean, look, it's a, it's a big book and it has a lot of, of lessons about life and, um, and love and problem solving and um, so forth. But it, I think it shaped me the, the most because really staying, you know, mentally healthy is the best gift that we can give to everybody around us. And, you know, you started talking about how hard this, this time is and um, people are like really suffering. And, you know, you look at the war, you look at what's going on, the stock market. I mean, it's just, there's no place to look where, you know, you can kind of get um, much of an uplift. And so we have to do that for, you know, each other and not, you know, blame anybody. And so, you know, I, I always said about leadership, you know, when you need a helping hand, look at the end of your arm <laughs> and, you know, mm -hmm. it's, um, it's, you know, cause you ultimately, you know, have to guide the organization and, you know, you, you lead with your authentic self first. And so you just, you know, kind of have to be accountable to everybody else for being your best thing. Pretty much, Shelly, sure, like being on a basketball team, you know, it's like you, you have an obligation to everybody else that you work on to bring your best self onto the, um, the, the, you know, the court. So, um, so I don't know, that was the one that, that stuck with me. I've read, you know, a lot of them and I, I don't know that you change from being a mentee to a mentor. Like, I feel like I've learned so much in the last five days. I had a great lunch yesterday in person with somebody I'm on a board with and, um, you know, just reflected when I got home about how much I learned. And so I think you, you know, I, I'm always getting mentored even at my age. And I, I certainly love giving back, but I, I don't, I think sometimes people was, don't even, you don't need, you do things and you don't even know they have an impact on people in big mm. ways. That's awesome. So now we're going to go ahead and open the floor up officially for questions from our participants. So let me go ahead here and start reading off some of these questions. The first one comes, uh, the first question we have here, how has servant leadership impacted your leadership style? I can take that one because I was really bad at um a part of leadership and how to make a big transition. And it was about, um, I always, you know, when I was at Spanx, I started the, you know, I started Sarah with Sarah, you know, so early on and, and I knew everything about the company and I knew everybody. And so I always felt like I was the one that had to find answers and, you know, to all the problems. And, um, as time went on, then I would co-create those answers with everyone until there was such a line at my door of people waiting for me to co-create with them that I was really suffering, you know, I was really stifling them. And I realized that they couldn't be the greatest leaders they were if I was always kind of there, you know, at the, you know, giving the assist and that they, to the point of the road less traveled, were not taking total accountability themselves for the good, you know, and the bad. And, um, and so, you know, the, I think that's where I really learned, like the, the best thing I could do was kind of a tough love approach of, you know, I know how to find the answer to this, but, you know, I need you to go find it yourself. And, you know, that created kind of a love hate relationship because they, they hate you when you raise a bar very high. 
know, but when they make it themselves, you know, like a two-year-old tying their shoes or doing whatever, you know, that's where real confidence comes from. And that's at least my version of, of servant leadership. Awesome. Yeah. Shelly, did you want to, yeah, weigh in on that? Yeah, I would add to that. So, you know, I think it's interesting, especially as women coming into leadership in the sports industry, I can speak to where women don't really have as much of representation or had in the past, right? Especially in sales coming in, you have such a high uh, bar on your shoulder that you have to perform because there's not, you know, you're, you're one of the first, um, you know, I mean, in 2022, I was the first African-American female chief commercial slash chief revenue officer, right? It's 2022, right? So you can think about that 16 years ago. So you're starting in leadership and, and to be, truly transparent and candid, you know, the focus is like, okay, well, I've got to achieve these metrics. I've got to achieve these goals. As a leader, that's, that's my, that's where my head was. It wasn't even about the people. And it's not like I didn't care about them. It's just that my focus was they put me in this role to hit these metrics and that's what's most important. And so I think it took time to learn over time through listening to people and failure and failing in some instances, right? Where you're not getting people to respond the way you want them to, and you're not getting the max potential from people. And you're, you refocus on what's important and how to truly like, okay, now I can say very clearly, very unapologetically, I'm, I'm leading for the team. Uh, Everything that I do is for the team. (laughs) Eventually we're going to hit our metrics as a result of what the team does. But my number one, most important responsibility are the team members, their health and well-being, and that they can reach their max potential. And that was a big learning curve um, coming into an industry where you're just trying to perform and execute. That's, that's fantastic. Okay, our next question. What challenges do you see in the next two to five years that we are not facing now? So if you had your crystal ball. <laughs> <laughs> That we're not that we're not facing now. I, mean, I know it's it's like it's, I can't even imagine challenges that you know we're <laughs> you know we're not facing. I don't know. Yeah, you know, maybe that you know I I always think that moderation in most situations is you know the the right solution. You know, you go too far one way or you know too far the other way. You know, ditch to ditch. Um, you always kind of get in trouble. And so I think there's a lot of repercussions of what has happened now that we probably don't know, you know, what um, I think about my 20 something kids that have not been in the office and people that have not been in school and, you know, what would be the lagging things that we're going to suffer with because, you know, of, of all of, all of the changes. And we may not know that because we've never, you know, had these exact circumstances anymore. I mean, look at all the PSD that came from, um, you know, wars and, you know, industrial revolutions. And I just don't think we know the psychological consequences, you know, behavioral consequences of, of what we've actually been through and are still going through. Um, for a really long time now, you know, we keep acting like it, I don't know, it seems like it was just, you know, a few months ago, but we've lost track of time during this period. So true. Yeah. Shelly, did you? Oh, yeah. So I absolutely agree with, with what she's saying. I think um, from a personal side and, and, and even from a professional side, I think I would speak to the business side of sports one, two, definitely within two years and, and probably even sooner something that you're going to see us facing is how to connect with consumers with media changes. So you think of all the streaming platforms and how people consume media differently compared to the different traditional ways in which they used to consume media via broadcast, right? Um, and so I think you're going to start seeing a lot of changes, you know, again, with platforms, whether it be Hulu or Netflix, like people are actually changing how they consume their own media. Um, and so that's gonna affect sports in a major way um, that I think that you'll start seeing sooner than later. Just if, if somehow we could keep the score off the internet, then everybody would have to watch the game. <laughs> <laughs> so true. So true. Don't tell me the score. Don't tell me the score. <laughs> okay, I, I think we have three more questions here, and I'm hoping we can it, we'll we'll be allowed the time to to make sure that we get to everyone's question. So another question that we have here is 
what do you see as the most impactful best practices for diversity, equity, and inclusion? I guess just to do it. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I, 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 yeah, I've, I mean, I serve on so many boards and Shelly, you can take this one first, but I mean, it's just, it's just so great when people actually focus on it and it's hard, but they take the challenge and they look at things in new ways. So I think it's, it's just simply putting effort forth. Yeah, I like that Nike just do it. <laughs> Look, I think it's about being authentic, right? Like it's, it's hard to say you're going to be authentic um, if you look at your board and it's all white males or all one dimension of anything, right? Like how can you be authentic in that space if you don't have the representation? So the second one is, is the representation piece, right? So you have to be authentic as an organization. You have to have representation so you can have the real conversations and come to real outcomes. And then the third one, which aligns with what Lorianne's saying, is you have to be intentional. You can't just sit back, oh, I'm like, we're going to talk about it. We're going to have this conversation. But yeah. then intentional action behind it. Um, and it has to be a part of the organization. It can't just be yeah. Eric sitting on the side. Oh, let's check these boxes to do it. Like, it literally needs to be within the fabric top down um, of how the organization's operating. Well, and, and I, Shelly, I com completely agree with you. And I've just seen such a... Uh, you know, a, sh a generational shift. I mean, my kids, I mean, they're in their 20s. I mean, they, they, they really don't see, I mean, they work with women. I mean, when I, when I was at Coca-Cola, I mean, I would be in a room, it would be me and 20 guys, like a lot. And mm -hmm. it, they just, they've never experienced any of that. And they, they have such different ideas about, you know, because they've grown up with on the computer and meeting everybody and, you know, getting content from every different place. And it just opens your eyes so that people are not just in their little, you know, tribes or moats or, you know, um, small areas. And I think that's really where, you know, great learning comes from is, you know, us all just being together and just appreciating our differences so much. And, it's, um, I've just seen it so naturally happen in all of my organizations with you know, certainly reminders, but it, to Shelly's point, it, 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 it becomes the fabric. And I think that the generation below me, it's, it's going to be even not even a question because they just don't, they don't, you know, see it in the same ways. I mean, I don't want to minimalize it because it's, it's certainly more than that, but I just think we're, we're doing it at warp speed and it's great. And we're talking about things which just, you know, makes everybody learn quicker. And I'm so glad you mentioned that about having just talking, communicating, and that's one of the benefits. Well, that's one of the good things that's come about as a result of technologies like Zoom, for example. We can all be here. Uh, Shelly's in Ohio, I'm in Atlanta, and Lorianne, you're in New York, and, and here we are. We're still able to participate in this conference. So that's, to your point, that is a, another great uh, advantage, I guess, of, of technologies like Zoom is that it, it enables us to connect with people that we probably ordinarily would never come into contact with. So um, I'm gonna skip ahead here to the very last question. And it comes from someone, uh, I believe in the Zoom chat, as leaders and managers in the new normal, can you give us some examples of the types of decisions you have had to make that have impacted or redefined your corporate culture? And I'll be happy to repeat that if you need me to I can say it. Lori, you know, I, can okay. start. <laughs> I can start with this one. Look, we just actually went through one. Like I mentioned to you, sports um, traditionally has been, you know, lots of long hours in, again, in the venue, you know, really grinding it out. And, um, and when we, after, so COVID happened, right? And then, you know, we kind of went where there was a, sort of, it, 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 it's, it's, Load up a little bit. And so we started getting fans back into the venue, you know, the, the laws change and, and our city protocol. And we, so our team members have been working for this full year, um, you know, from home hundred percent virtually, and they have been doing a tremendous job. I'm talking, you know, we were second in the NBA in revenue of all 30 NBA teams. Um, we came in second in our market, which is not, you know, we're comparing against New York and LA's, which have much wider market reach. Um, so they were working really hard is the moral of that story. But then we came. Yeah, you're like a 
fabulous success is the moral of that story. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Thank you. Um, and so we were, you know, the, our leadership team and our, and our CEO was ready and, and, and he wanted people back in the office, partly to say that, hey, um, you know, we want our fans back in the office, so we really want our team members here and, you know, we're in the same building. And, you know, we knew there was going to be pushback, even as a leadership team, we didn't all agree on it because we thought there should be, you know, some type of adjustment flexibility. Needless to say, we tried to go 100% back in the office. And I would tell you after a week, um, our leadership team collectively got together and we said, look, I, we've got, we're going to lose good people, right? Mm-hmm. And we actually changed that because you're asking people who were working already at like 100 plus percent to now still work at that level, but change all of the light, like what they just basically spent two years doing and throw it out of the window and add that to coming into the office now, sometimes 8 a.m. to 10 p.m., right? Mm-hmm. So we literally changed protocols of coming in much later in game days, having a one permanent day off of flex throughout the week, which still is, is not, is still conservative compared to other uh, industries. But for this organization, it was a big change that, and it was the, the team members. It was us saying like, look, they, they're not happy with this and, <laughs> and we need to address it if we're going to keep strong quality uh, team members that we want here. So that was a big change that we had based off of COVID, based off of listening to our team members. Lorianne? I mean, okay. just, you know, I think, um, no, I was having this conversation at lunch yesterday about, um, you know, when you're a leader of an organization, you know, you would, I had a very specific um, engagement strategy, right? You know, the, the thing that you had to do was, you know, be in front of people, have relationships with people, be seen. You know, I used to stand at the elevator in the morning, you know, from eight to nine-ish, not every day, but I would try to just kind of hang around, you know, as people were coming into work um, because you would just be able to say hello or, you know, say, hey, how was this? Or um, have somebody see you or if somebody wanted to ask you something, they could informally, you know, come do that. And, um, you know, it it didn't become like a meeting time, but it, be, it just became, a way to, um, you know, to connect and, you know, even, you know, with boards, but certainly within organizations, there's just no way to really do that, you know, as a, as a leader, you can't schedule a, you know, a 30 second bump in on a zoom. And, you know, this, this um, CEO I was talking to yesterday, he's like, I, I, just can't, I, you know, I've lost touch with people. It's like, I, I can zoom and we have meetings, but it's, it's not that like, you know, that's cool that I, you don't even know if somebody's pregnant on Zoom. You don't know how tall they are on Zoom. And <laughs> I would, you know, I figured that Shelly was probably tall, but I've worked with somebody for two years on a board who I thought was short and he was like six, three, two. And it was like, <laughs> I haven't seen people's profiles. I mean, it's, it's um, so it's like I don't know how to recreate that, and boards are having a really hard time because that you you can't read somebody's body language. You know, you don't know like when you're in a room with you know seven, eight, ten people. It's like you know you can tell how somebody's like fidgeting, what they might be thinking, when to reach out to them, like. Shelly, it looks like you have something you want to add to this conversation, and there's just that just, you just can't do it. And there's wonderful things about Zoom, but you know, there's also not so wonderful things. And um, so I think, you know, what you described Shelly is again, finding moderation. It's like, you know, finding a way to, um, you know, to, to have your cake and eat it too, to, you know, um, to get the in-person training, casualness, knowing someone and, um, and then also the flexibility that I certainly didn't have as a young mom, you know, when my kids were sick, I was still in the office and, you know, plane was late and I couldn't figure out how to get, you know, uh, a babysitter to the house, you know, um, so it's, it's going to be, you know, moderation, but I, I, for one, am a believer that, um, not generationally that older people, you know, can't be, um, you know, don't understand technology or have the old ways of thinking. I just don't think they're really old ways. We've been connecting as humans in person, you know, 
forever. And this is certainly a wonderful, wonderful tool, like the telephone was, <laughs> like email was, but, you know, all of that went wrong, you know, at times as well. So we're just going to have to find that, you know, that balance where, um, you know, people get what they need. With that, with that being said, I want to thank you both again, Shelly and Lorianne, for such an engaging and informative panel discussion. Thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom and insights with us. And I think this concludes our panel discussion. So thank you all who have attended. And Libby, uh, I guess we'll turn it over, turn it back over to you. And you're you're muted. <laughs> okay. Oh, there we go. I. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Well, I just want to say thank you to all of you. That was an, a really insightful and educational conversation. I think um, I certainly have a few takeaways uh, for myself, and I assume you know others do as well, um, that are going to help all of us be more effective in navigating change and being more inspiring leaders. So Thank you all uh, for the fantastic conversation. All right. Bye, everyone. It was great bye. seeing you. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I was with you in person. <laughs>